Okay, so uh, I'd like to uh, talk today about uh, what we did with uh, Collaboration Network and how we applied it to COVID-19 research using PIDGRAPH. So we built a collaboration network between uh, Amir, myself, and uh, Jingbo. And what we did was we applied uh, the PIDGRAPH concept uh, to COVID-19 research to build this network. Now, before we go ahead, uh, there are a few organizations I need to thank. So I'd like to thank Research Graph, then the Australian Access Federation, where I work. Uh, also, ANU and Swinburne University. So uh, Jingbo and Amir work at both of those institutions, respectively. But uh, we'd also like to thank Orchid ID, then Crossref Data Site, Grid, as well as ISNI, because these are the ident persistent identifiers and infrastructure we've used when developing our collaboration network and using it to look at collaboration across the research. Now, uh, before we go ahead, what I just wanted to quickly talk about was about collaboration. So collaboration essentially is the practice of sharing knowledge to achieve common goals. And Collaboration Network is a group of individuals who like working together to achieve a common purpose. Now, last year at Peter Palooza, I talked about building collaboration networks using PIDGRAPH. And what I'm going to show you today is how uh, Amir, myself, and Jingbo, what we did was we used the PIDGRAPH concept to analyze collaborations on COVID-19 related research. But the most important question we need to ask ourselves is, or at least people have been asking me is why exactly COVID-19 collaboration network? Why not something else? Uh, it was quite simple. Uh, COVID-19 has been a major talking point for all of 2020. Looks like it's going to be a big talking point in 2021. I don't see it going uh, away anytime soon. But more importantly, what we've noticed is that while COVID-19 swept across the globe wreaking unprecedented havoc, uh, it is also leaving its mark on research, both in the short term as well as in the longer term. Now, in the short term, we've seen uh, researchers and funds being repurposed and prioritized towards COVID-19 research. And what we've also seen is those researchers from disciplines who generally are quite averse to collaborating outside their disciplines are starting to do that a lot more. And this is something we hope is a trend that works in the longer term for research because it inevitably results in open data sharing, open research. But it's not just me who says uh, how collaboration is helping COVID-19, but then again, National Institute of Health have actually stated that uh, collaborations helping speed COVID-19 research, and it does that by getting to getting together people with complementary skills. There are a couple of magazines like uh, The Scientist, uh, which also talks about how big data can be used to help fight COVID-19. And then there are also researchers who are specialists in their field coming out and saying that uh, having a collaborative research culture is quite vital, which is why it is important to know how collaboration is taking place and what we can do to encourage it more. So uh, just before I start showing, uh, explaining how we built a collaboration network, uh, this is how a collaboration network would generally look for an individual. So this is Amir's collaboration network. In the middle, you can see Amir's picture. It's a bit tiny at the moment, but that's there. The green dots all signify people Amir has worked with or collaborated with, and the purple dots signify the institutions that the people he's worked with are affiliated to. Now, on the left-hand side, you can look at which countries he's collaborated with. And on the right-hand side at the bottom, you can see the number of collaborators per country on the map. So how did we build collaboration network using PIDs? Uh, effectively, it starts off with uh, looking at a journal paper or an authored publication, which has a DOI. Now, 
that publication, say for example, you have two researchers with ORCID IDs, researcher A and researcher B co-authoring it. Now researcher A belongs to university X, researcher B belongs to university Y. So because both of them have co-authored on a single paper, we can effectively say that university X is collaborating with university Y. So this is the basis of how we are mapping our collaborations or how we are looking at collaborations between institutions and collaborations between countries. Now we can take this a little bit further and say A collaborates with C, D collaborates with C, and then uh, if you're looking at the bigger picture, you can see collaboration happening across the board. Now, Amir and I, we presented a coronavirus collaboration network at the e-research conference in 2020 at Octo in October uh, in Australia. And one of the things we noticed is we analyzed the same data set in September 2020. And now for the Peter Palooza conference, we also analyzed it in January 2020. And towards the end, I'll show you the differences and what I think is the reason for those discrepancies. But starting off, you see over here in December 2019, sorry, December 2009, there are 1,500 research organizations approximately that were working on uh, coronavirus research or collaborating on coronavirus research. Now, if we were to go a little bit ahead, uh, you can see that uh, you can see Great Britain universities from uh, organizations from Great Britain, as well as organizations from the United States. Fast forward that 10 years later to December 2019, and it's just doubled. So from 1,500, you're now looking at about 3,200 research organizations collaborating on uh, coronaviruses. And if you think this doubling in 10 years is good, in, three in two months, it's tripled itself to 9,200 uh, odd research organizations that are now collaborating on coronaviruses. Uh, we can look at it a little bit more further. So when we go into April, it becomes close to 16,000 research organizations. A little bit further, you look into June, and now you have 27,000 uh, research organizations that are actually collaborating on COVID-19 uh, research. Now, in December 2020, what we found out is that there are about close to 47,000 research organizations approximately that are actually collaborating on coronavirus research. Now, remember how I told uh, we analyzed data, the same data in September 2020, and then we analyzed it again in Jan 2020, and this is what we've noticed. So in December 2009, when we analyzed the data in September 2020, there were about 1,300 odd research organizations that came up. When we did the same thing in Jan 2020, it was 1,500. And as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the green denotes data that was analyzed uh, this month, in this year, in Jan 2021. And in red, it outlines what we analyzed in September 2020 for the e-research conference. And you'll notice that there is quite a bit of difference, especially over here, where in Feb 2020, it says 3,596. But in Jan 21, it is now 9,243, that same number. So that's a massive increase. And what we think is contributing to it is that since then, since September, uh, a lot of people, a lot of researchers have been coming ahead and have been claiming their publications are there've been a lot more there've been publications with DOIs and ORCID IDs. And because what we are doing is effectively analyzing and looking at ORCID IDs and DOIs, what it tells us is that since then there's been a lot more people using ORCID IDs and a lot more people using DOIs, which is why we're getting that increased number. Now, for those of y'all who are more interested in how exactly uh, the collaboration network 
was formed, uh, what we do is we are also looking at the research graph augment API, which, which is uh, which is what enriched this data and allowed us to build this sort of network. So effectively over here where you see research objects or bibliographic records, this is the research graph corpus on what on which we put in the search terms like COVID-19, coronavirus, as well as SARS-CoV-2. And we did a search for any mention of these words, either in the abstract, in the body, or in the title of the paper. And then we put it into the graph database and augment it via the research graph augment API. So that in turn then looks at data that comes in from ORCID, comes in from Crossref, data that comes from Scolix and Datasite. And then uh, it helps build uh, the sort of graph that you've seen. Now, uh, I'm just going to give a plug for Amir's session, which is happening at uh, three hours from now at five o'clock or 5.30. And what Amir is going to be talking about is how, if you're interested in playing with this collaboration network, then Amir is going to take you step-by-step step about how we went about creating it in Gephi and Neo4j and how he's used PIDs to do it. So that is something you definitely want to uh, attend if it is, if coronaviruses and collaboration network is your jam. Questions? Thanks. Um, thanks for that, Milroy. Um, that's really fascinating. Um, I'm just popping up here to encourage people to ask questions. I was going to get ready to um, send you my five minute um, warning, but you're early. So um, well done on that. Um, I'll give people a bit of time to think about questions. I'm not going to do any elevator music while you think about that. Um, so that's nice. Uh, in the meantime, Melroy, can I ask what um, what was it about uh, looking looking at this that surprised you? Um, what kind of things did you that turned up that you didn't expect in this visualization? Uh, for starters, what we didn't expect, uh, what we thought was when we had analyzed the data in January, we would see similar sort of results. We didn't expect to see a ma a massive difference like what we just saw. And that was quite surprising because uh, generally, if you're analyzing the exact same data, you shouldn't see any differences. It should be more or less the same, but we started seeing differences. And one of the things uh, when we then uh, started digging deeper into it, it, we realized that it could be because the data itself hadn't changed, but there was a lot more metadata underneath it. And what that did was it just allowed us to pull in more connections and look at it much better. So the more persistent ident, I guess the bottom line is the more we use persistent identifiers, uh, the more the metadata gets enriched and then uh, the more better connections we can see. So it just becomes a much more richer ecosystem in which you can get a lot more analysis and information from. Mm, certainly. And I guess we're seeing the impact of um, other, well, more funding opportunities and um, and and solving COVID nineteen or solving coronavirus. Yeah. So initially, initially we started this off as a question to answer uh, what are the funding opportunities available and how do you find out people you've collaborated with in the past with whom you can collaborate again on. Uh, accessing new funding opportunities and doing more interesting research. However, and that was what I had spoken at Pitapalooza last year. But then since then, uh, with COVID-19 and a lot of work being done towards COVID-19, so a lot of research was being repurposed towards it. It just made sense to look at it from a COVID-19 perspective, look at it from a COVID-19 lens and see is there does it tell us anything interesting? Uh, is there information that we can then use 
and uh, does it make sense? So one of the things, another use of this could be actually looking at it and trying to find out if there are particular experts in on coronavirus research, you can literally look at their collaboration network and that would then allow you to a certain degree say that, well, if they've been collaborating with these people, they may also be experts in coronaviruses or at least some sort of allied discipline, which would be useful. So it just starts helping you narrow down the possibilities because if you're looking at a lot of research uh, and we looked at about 233,000 odd publications, if that's the sort of research you're looking, uh, to be able to just narrow it down to a few hundred so much more easier when you have enriched metadata. Yes, once again, metadata um, comes out on top, um, yes. which, which is great to see. Um, and here's a plug for metal data, um, which is, um, I put the L in there because that's for the linked data, which um, PIDGRAPH obviously uh, represents and um, leverages so wonderfully. Uh, I'm going to do a final call for questions. So if you're hanging out there in the chat and there's something that you're not quite sure how to ask, just, you know, blurt it out. Um, we can workshop coherence. That's okay. Um, I know I often feel that way sometimes when I'm faced with asking a question. Um, I got a comment from Todd there on metadata speeding the discovery of new science. That's right. Um, it's um, it's cool stuff. I feel like I'm just getting into the speed of my daytime television compare voice. Uh, thank you thank for you. that, everybody. All right.